So my talk is going to be about semi-classical analysis, as you may have seen on the, on the website. And probably not all of you are familiar with the term semi-classical analysis, so I will give a short uh, introduction to what, what it actually means. So classical, you may recognize this word from... Sorry, just one second. Um, yes. Really? Yeah, it's, I, it's, I, it's working, it's just not... Yes. Yeah, but then it's okay, because everyone here can hear it, and then it's in the recording, just, just continue. All right. Um, yeah, classical from physics, classical physics, and we have there this uh, correspondence between classical and quantum mechanics. And what you want to do in semi-classical analysis is you want to kind of uh, go between these two scales, between quantum mechanics and between, cla between classical mechanics. So, for example, if we have light in the quantum world, it behaves like, like a wave. Um, but if engineers want to design a lens or something, they calculate it as if it was a straight line. And with semi-classical analysis, we want to have some kind of tool to mathematically rigorously show that this straight line approximation is the correct approximation for, for uh, effects that are actually quantum, but we see also in, the, in our classical world. So see the first point, it's a powerful tool to uh, mathematically analyze this correspondence between classical and uh, quantum mechanics. But that's, of course, not the only area where it's useful. There's also the analysis of black holes. And here at ETH, we have a, a resident uh, expert on this field. It's Professor Hinz. Um, maybe you have a course with him. And it's also closely related to microlocal analysis. Of course, if, if you're not familiar with semi-classical analysis, you probably don't know what microlocal analysis is. Uh, maybe I'll talk a little bit about this in the end. Okay, so let's have a closer look at what exactly we want to study. So maybe you know from classical physics, we have this Hamiltonian function here, this P. And it depends on position and momentum. So position x, momentum xi. And it's just some function from R to n, to R. And this kind of describes the energy of the system. And we can then, with this Hamiltonian, we can find the equations of motion, which describe how the system evolves over time. Now, if we go to the quantum world, what I've been told, what physicists usually do, is they, they know the classical Hamiltonian. So they just take this classical Hamiltonian and plug for each momentum variable, they plug in uh, differentiation. And not only just differentiation, but special one, this h dx, and h is Planck's constant, and this dx is this uh, scaled partial differential with respect to x. So in the best case scenario, we get here a differential operator, which is called the Hamilton operator. And then to get the time evolution of the quantum uh, wave function, which is here, this u, we use the Schrödinger equation. And semi-classical analysis kind of wants to analyze how this, these equations, possibly Schrödinger equation, possibly some, L, some other quantum mechanical equation, how these behave when we vary this h. And this h has kind of the role of an effective wavelength, so you can imagine if we have some other wave type, uh, something else that behaves like a wave, then we can also use semi-classical analysis to, to study this phenomenon. Okay, so this was the, the nice intuitive introduction. So now we want to start with some uh, mathematics. It's not too hard, don't worry. Um, so first I want to talk about some very important tools in semi-classical analysis. First one is the Fourier transform, and the second one, which arises from the Fourier transform, is the, our uh, pseudo differential operators. And then I also want to talk about two more 
general concepts, which are not directly related to semi-classical analysis, but which will be used for the grand finale of the talk, which is the proof of Weyl's law. And Weyl's law is it's kind of a formula for the asymptotic behavior of eigenfunctions of differential operators. All right, so let's start. So maybe a few of you have already seen the Fourier transform. In semi-classical analysis, we have this parameter h, so we have to adapt this Fourier transform for this case. So we start here with the first definition. We take some function u in the Schwartz space. If you don't know what the Schwartz space is, it's just imagine smooth functions which rapidly decay at infinity. It's not that important here. And we define its Fourier transform, its semi-classical Fourier transform by this formula here. Zoom in. Let me see. Is this good? All right. The semi-classical Fourier and, uh, transform. And maybe if you don't know what the Fourier transform exactly is, so you take a function, and the Fourier transform gives you another function. And what you want to know is, for your original function, at what frequencies does, does it oscillate? And the Fourier transform gives you, for each frequency, it gives you the amount of oscillation at this point for this frequency. Okay, what is uh, most important here is that we can have some very nice properties for the Fourier transform. So first of all, it's invertible with this formula here on the right. And it's almost the same formula. We just have, uh, we don't have a minus here in the exponent. So it has kind of almost the same properties. And the properties that we want to use for the next part are the following ones. So say we have a function u, and we differentiate it with respect to x, with this h, h dx. Then we take the Fourier transform. This is the same as if we just Fourier transform the function, and then multiply xi on the left. And the other way around, if we first multiply an x to this function and then Fourier transform, it's the same as if we just Fourier transformed first and then we differentiate with respect to xi. And this gives us this relation between uh, polynomials in xi. So if we raise xi to some power n, then we get n and times a derivative. And if we differentiate n times, we get x to the n. And this leads us to the notion of pseudo-differential operators. So first, let's just take a differential operator here. It's a uh, sum with some coefficient functions, C alpha uh, times differenti differential operator. And I'm using here multi-index notation. So if you're not familiar with this, just imagine it's, uh, it's a one-dimensional variable, this alpha here. And what we can do now is we can re rewrite this differential operator in this form here. So we first Fourier transform, we multiply it by this polynomial here, where we just we, uh, substituted for the differentiation, we substituted the xi. And then we Fourier transform back. And now no one comes and tells us, OK, you can only use for, um, polynomials for this multiplication in the, for the Fourier transformed function. So we may just as well take anything else. And this is where the theory of the pseudo-differential operators start. So we take any function, depending on three variables, x, y, xi. I will tell you later why we have a third one. And for now, I just take it in the Schwartz space. And we construct the associated pseudo-differential operator, it's op h of a, by its action on, the func on functions. And this is the definition, and it looks a bit long, but it's basically just the same as we had above here. We Fourier transform, we multiply, and then we Fourier transform back. And we call this A, 
in the op H of A, we call this the symbol of the pseudo differential operator. And it doesn't really matter where you take this symbol in what function space, as long as you can somehow make sense of this right hand side here as an integral. That's the important part. Okay, let's have a look at some examples. Right, first one, 1 minus h squared uh, times the Laplacian. So if we take the symbol, we get 1 plus xi squared. Very nice polynomial. And the cool thing about this operator is that we can actually use the pseudo-differential operators to find an inverse operator for, for this differential operator, which I don't know, otherwise would maybe be a bit tedious to find. And what we do is we just take the pseudo-differential operator, which is associated to the multiplicative inverse of the symbol, right? Makes sense. We had this correspondence between multiplication and differentiation. So now we can, instead of taking the inverse of the differentiation, we take the inverse of the multiplication, which is a lot easier. And indeed, this gives us an inverse operator for compactly supported smooth functions on Rn. And you can even generalize these constructions for, uh, for other symbols. They have to have some kind of uh, property, but uh, I don't want to get into this now. And more generally, we can also consider the semi-classical differential operators, where we have the symbols, polynomials and xi, with some coefficient functions, b alpha. Now let's look at what happens if we change this dependence of the coefficient functions between uh, x and y. So if we only have x dependence in the coefficient functions, so the alpha only depends on x, what we do then it, with the pseudo-differential operator is it acts on functions by first differentiating alpha times and then multiplying on the coefficient functions. On the other hand, if we only have y dependence of the b alphas, what we do is we first multiply our function with the coefficient functions, and then we differentiate the whole package. And uh, this comes kind of from the fact that we have this correspondence between multiplication and differentiation. The problem is multiplication is commutative, but differentiation and multiplication by a function is not commutative in general. So we have these two possibilities. Now in physics, we usually have observables, and they have to form a x xi, x position xi uh, momentum. So we want to have uh, some kind of notion what it means for this to be, to plug it in into a pseudo-differential operator. And what we do here is kind of an interpolation solution. We fix some t between 0 and 1. Oh, sorry. That's enough. OK. So we, we take some t, um, and we, different, we define the operator of ht of a just as the pseudo-differential operator associated to this symbol here, where we interpolate between x and y. You see, if we, if we set uh, t equals 0, we get something like here in the second row. Can you see this? Yes. And if we set t equal 1, we get something like the first one. And we call this the quantization. And this is kind of a mathematically rigorous way uh, for the process I described at the start, where you take the Hamiltonian of a function and you replace the xi variables by differentiation. And now we have uh, found a very nice way to do this mathematically. All right. Now I want to talk a little bit about symbols. All right. So we fix some R, m in R, some real number. And we want to define the space of uniform symbols of order m, s m, in two, these are functions a, in two variables, x and xi, obviously. And we want to capture this behavior of, of differential operators in our symbol space, because we also want the differential operators to be 
in the space of uh, symbols that we consider, right? And what we do for this is we, we kind of mimic the, the polynomial nature of these in Xi. So, and this is what this line here does. So first of all, these brackets around the Xi, this is just some regularized version of the absolute value. So for all intents and purposes, just imagine that this Xi is an absolute value. This uh, bracket Xi is an absolute value. And now we take our symbol, and if you think back to the uh, definition of uh, semi-classical uh, differential operator, what we have there is, if we differentiate in x, we just differentiate the coefficient functions. So we don't, it doesn't, nothing happens to the size. So we can still bound the size by the highest order polynomial uh, in, the, in the polynomial. So this reflects here in the, in the fact that we don't have any influence on the bound of the symbol if we differentiate alpha times in the x variable. On the other hand, if we differentiate beta times in the xi variable, of course, if we differentiate a polynomial beta times, you uh, reduce its degree by beta, right? And this, again, reflects here in this bound. All right. Now, we also want, we're in semi-classical analysis, we want to have this dependence on the h parameter. So we take some h between take h between 0 and 1. What we do is we just take families of symbols which smoothly depend on the h. That's what is written here. And these are now our symbols for the semi-classical case. We denote it's the space by s h m. And now let us also uh, give names to the pseudo-deferential operator spaces. So psi m h is the space of pseudo-differential operators of order m. And this is just pseudo-differential operators of symbols of order m. And this m obviously stands for, qualitatively speaking, of how many different derivatives you take with the pseudo-differential operator. And now a special space that I want to isolate is this psi to the minus infinity, which is the intersection of all the negative degree pseudo-differential operators. And these are called the smoothing operators. And if we take this intuition again of uh, the degree is how many derivatives you take, you see that a negative number gives you kind of an antiderivative. So we want, so this gives us some kind of integration. So if we do this infinitely many times, we get infinitely many derivatives in some sense. So whenever I apply an operator in this space to some function, it spits out a, a smooth function. This is why they're called smoothing operators. The last thing I want to talk about here is um, the so-called principal symbol. The principal symbol is if we have some A of order M, symbol of order M, and then we define its principal symbol by the projection onto the quotient space of symbols of order m modulo symbols of order m minus 1. If you think of differential operators, this just corresponds to throwing away all differentiations which, are less, which, which have order less than m. So we just keep the very, the very uh, top part of the, of the symbol. And the nice thing is that this actually dominates the behavior of our pseudo-differential operator. It's not uh, so. Yeah, you might think, okay, if I throw away half the half the symbol, how nice can it be? But it's actually not that much of a loss of information. Yeah, and yeah, I say it again. So it contains the information on the highest order of the pseudo-differential operator. Okay. So now we can come to Vale's law. And uh, here I'm following uh, Professor Hint's um, notes on this subject. So 
let me kind of introduce what it actually is about. So the original paper is by Hermann Weil. He was here at ETH, a professor in, I don't know, a few hundred years or 100 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> and um, so the, he published a paper in 1911. It's called Über die Asymptotische Verteilung der Eigenwerte. It's a very nice paper. It's about eigenvalues of differential operators. And uh, I mean, if you can read German, then go ahead and read it. I think it's even readable for first-year students uh, with, some, with some looking up on Wikipedia, I guess. And so let's get more concrete. What actually is this about? So we take M to be some n-dimensional compact manifold. And if you're not too comfortable with manifolds, just imagine a sphere or a torus in R3. And we want to take some symmetric pseudo-differential operator of order m on this manifold. And we have, so maybe a word to symmetric. Symmetric just, it ensures that the eigenvalues of the, of the operator are real. And we take some interval in R, and we want to find the number of eigenvalues of this operator which lie in the interval. This is kind of a hard problem, so we will be satisfied with just knowing how many eigenvalues are in this interval if we let h go to zero. And maybe a little remark to this whole manifold deal. So the theory of semi-classical pseudo-differential operators on manifolds is very similar to, to the one on the Euclidean space. So you can just take all your intuition, if you have any by now, <laughs> and uh, transfer it to the, to the manifold case. And maybe the most important difference... Oh, yes, thank you. The most important difference that we have here is that the symbols are now defined on the cotangent bundle. Okay, so I, I looked up uh, the analysis, analysis 2 uh, syllabus, and I saw the first-year students already had... Uh, some manifolds, so we kind of assume that you have some kind of intuition of what exactly the ta tangent bundle is. But uh, just for some more intuition, so you have the manifold, right? And our symbol depends on x and xi. Uh, if we think in physics terms, this x denotes some position. So we are somewhere on the manifold, at some point on the manifold. And now the xi is a momentum. So attaches to this point, and it points in some direction, tangent to this point. And so this is why we're on some kind of tangent bundle. But the thing is, in physics, the momenta don't transform like, like uh, the, usual, the usual vector spaces. So we kind of have to, to go to the cotangent bundle for, for these transformation rules. So if we, if we take over coordinates, we want this, this symbol to transform the correct way. So we have to go to the cotangent bundle. But for the intuition, it's okay if you just think of a point on the manifold and some kind of direction on the tangent space. Okay. Now let's look at two tools that we're going to use for the proof of Weyl's law. First one is trace of an operator. You know from linear algebra, hopefully, that if you take some matrix A, uh, matrix on R, N, then you can define the trace as just taking the sum of the diagonal entries. Or more generally, if you have an uh, orthonormal basis, you can define it as the sum of the scalar products, A, E, I, product with E, I. Now we kind of want this want to generalize this for infinite dimensional vector spaces. But these are in general weird. If you have a Banach space, you even have uncountable bases. So what we want to do is we want to do this on a Hilbert space. So we take some sort of differential operator, AH, which is a smoothing operator. And as our Hilbert space, we take square integrable functions on the manifold. 
So just the, the integral over the entire manifold of the absolute value squared is finite of these functions in here. And now on Hilbert spaces, we can find autonomous systems, which I will also denote by the small e. And um, these are kind of generalizations of bases for finite dimensional vector spaces. It's just an infinite, infinite collection of vectors. And every point in the Hilbert space can be written as an infinite uh, linear combination of these basis vectors. And then we can go on as in the finite case, we just define the trace as the sum over these scalar products. But now we have an infinite sum. And it turns out, since we choose, chose such a nice operator, we can actually write this in this form here, where we have as a, the main part is this 1 divided by 2 pi h to the n, times the integral of the symbol over the entire cotangent bundle, plus something of order h to the minus n plus 1. Okay, nice. We will use this in the, in the proof. And the second tool is the functional calculus. It's also kind of a generalization of the linear algebra for finite. Uh, for finite dimensional vector spaces. So we take some p, uh, m-dimensional pseudo-differential operator, with principal symbol p, small p, which is elliptic. So elliptic is kind of an invertibility condition. And for this, for this talk, let's just assume it's, uh, it's, it's a nice enough symbol. And since we're on Hilbert space, we can find an orthonormal system of eigenfunctions for this pseudo-differential operator. We call these small ej, and the corresponding eigenvalues we call capital ej. And now we pick some function f, compactly supported and smooth, and want to define what it means if we apply this function to the operator. And what we do is we define it on this orthonormal system, namely the function evaluated at the operator applied to one of these eigenfunctions is just the function evaluated at the eigenvalue times the eigenfunction. Right? This is similar. You can, if you go to the finite case, you can diagonalize your matrix, and then you can apply the function to all your diagonal entries, and then you can somehow define what it means to take functions of matrices. Okay, and now it's a fact that this function of the operator is a smoothing operator, and its principal symbol is f uh, composed with p. And we're going to use this as well. Okay. And now uh, we are ready to tackle Weyl's law. And this is the theorem statement. So we fix some m positive. This is the order of our pseudo-differential operator p, which is, again, assumed to be symmetric. So we have real eigenvalues. And we have a principal symbol small p, which is, again, elliptic. And we denote the eigenvalues of ph, again, by the e, capital E. And now for we have this tech, rather technical condition. So we, we take A and B real, and we want that this map here, which maps A and B to the volume of the pre-image of an interval to be continuous at the interval that we look at. This is uh, not important. We can kind of uh, ignore this for, for the qualitative understanding here. Then what we have is the number of eigenvalues in this interval AB is 1 divided by 2 pi h to the n times the volume of the space in the cotangent bundle of uh, where the symbol is actually between a and b, plus something that goes to 0 as h goes to 0. And I, I drew a little picture here to make this a bit more tangible. So we have here our p a symbol, which has some, I don't know, looks somehow 
like this, and we have our interval. And now what this tells us is that the number of eigenvalues is proportional to the volume down here of these, uh, of these patches, which I find kind of astonishing that you can connect uh, these two things. So let's look at the proof. It's very short and uh, I think very elegant. So <clears throat> we pick two functions, f1, f2, compactly supported, such that the f1 is smaller than the characteristic function of the interval, and the f2 is larger than the characteristic function. So here again a picture. And what we have now, remember when we apply the <clears throat> a function to the operator, <clears throat> sorry, we define it by its action on the eigenfunctions. So if we apply the characteristic function here, we apply the characteristic function to the operator, it is only one if the eigenvalue is in this interval, right? So this gives us the middle part here in this inequality. So the number of eigenvalues which are in the, in the interval and then again using the, the properties of the trace, we see that the trace of, the, of F1 of P is less than this number and the trace of F2 of P is larger than this number. All right, and now we use the formula that we found for the trace. So we know that these Fs are smoothing, so we can apply the formula. And what we get is this here. The trace is equal to 1 divided by 2 pi hn times the integral of f1 p x xi over the entire cotangent bundle plus something of order h to the minus n plus 1. And now the volume of this of the area where the principal symbol is above A and below B is just equal to this integral here, to the characteristic function of this region, right? So if we just choose the F1 and the F2 close enough to the, to the actual characteristic function, this yields the result that we were looking for, namely this here. And uh, this is also why we, we needed this additional assumption of discontinuity so that uh, we can actually sandwich, sandwich the number here by these, um, by these integrals. You see, if F1 and F2 approach the characteristic functions on both sides, we just get tighter and tighter bounds here for this number of eigenvalues. And... Uh, this concludes the proof. That's all. And uh, for the last part, I just want to show you like uh, a small little application of this. So we take the so-called Laplace-Beltrami operator. It's just Laplace operator on the manifold. And we order its eigenvalues in, uh, increasing, in an increasing fashion. Then what we can deduced from this theorem that we just proved is that the number of eigenvalues for some fixed number n, the number that is less th of eigenvalues that are less than n is just omega d times the volume of the manifold divided by 2 pi d times n to the d half plus something that goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And this omega d is just some, some constant. Uh, of course, this 2 pi d is also some constant. And the nice thing about this, in my opinion, is that it somehow relates the, the geometry of M with this volume of M and the eigenvalues of your operator. And uh, I think I've actually seen uh, talks where they go even further with this, where they can actually find the number of corners that uh, a, certain, uh, a certain manifold with boundary has. So this really, this, I think this... A lot of research still happening that tries to understand how eigenvalues of 
of differential operators and um, geometry play together. All right, and that was it. Thank you for being here, and yeah.